Peter makes the great confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. In uh, Matthew 16, and I'll start with verse 13. <clears throat> and uh, the title of the sermon this morning is, Is Your Key Worn? And I know that you have keys that are worn because you use them a lot, and certain ones are worn more than others. So I want you to keep that in mind. Also, before I read, uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, as I think about the history of uh, Severn Christian Church and First Christian started over here on Oak Manor Drive, and uh, I think about it, I came in 1995, and uh, Gary Strago was preaching then, and deacons and elders and uh, leadership there, and uh, the church was, was growing there, and, the, and they added staff, and I was one of those individuals. And, um, but here, here's something that I recognize, and, and George can testify to this, and, and folks who have been around for a while, uh, Kenny and, and Mark uh, uh, Lance, and uh, that if you think about how did the church uh, grow in those early days, and how did it get to the place where it went from three services over there in that smaller building to needing more room and building this, purchasing the property and building this building here, and uh, as I think back to those times, I think about the whole experience, whether it be you know, here in the, uh, where we worship and, and bring the word, and where we worship together and praise the Lord, where we serve here on this campus. And as I think about the programs and everything we've tried to do through the years, and even here now, and what we'll continue to try to do, the one thing that made the church grow through those years, and it's the same formula that we see in the Bible, because that's what we're trying to follow, we're a New Testament church, and it is this idea. It's not what happens in here, even at this moment. And the great programs we had, the great VBSs we've had through the years. But it's everything that takes place outside of this property, outside of these walls, and outside of the convenience and comfort we have right here. It happens outside the walls. So as I preach through this passage here, I want you to think about that. Peter is giving keys, but they're not the keys to the front door of this building. They're keys to the souls of people, the opportunity to preach the gospel to lost souls. And some of them are here, but most of them are out there where you work and play and shop. And so the question is, is your key worn? Notice what it says here. Jesus is having a very intimate time with the apostles. And for the first time, he's going to ask them a very personal question that they need to resolve in their own hearts and minds if indeed they're going to lead the, be the first ones to lead the church. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The most important question for all humanity, for all ages. Who is the Son of Man? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, any one of them. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, keys are something that were, uh, are essential to our life, aren't they? We have keys for everything. And now, I don't like the new keys for cars. I'm going to steal a key that goes in there, and now you just beat things and everything. And, but they make keys, um, even for kids. Right here, uh, Piper likes to play with these, and uh, she really liked this right here. And, so you can open the car. What's this one? This is this. Start the car. Yeah. But I'm telling you, Piper is the first child to, at a really early age, hit these, find these buttons and learn how to do it, right? But she also likes to dance, doesn't she? And uh, her favorite dance is her both feet are planted, and she goes like this. That's what she likes to do. But look, she was the first child not only to press these buttons, but she made it break dance. She would go. And she would wiggle like this. And so we have, uh, we have keys for all ages. 
But today I want us to examine the keys that were handed over to Peter. He was handed authority and essentially it was also handed down to us. And keys signify ownership, responsibility, and authority. Uh, remember your first car? That's probably maybe, you know, the, the first set of keys that you got to say, this is mine. I own this. And, uh, and I remember my first key to my car. Uh, it was a little bit older car at the time. and Somebody fixed it all up. And uh, it was a gold key because it was a manufactured key. It was a replacement key. But I, I didn't care. All I know is I got that set of keys and, uh, that I could put in that ignition, and that was going to be mine. And, uh, but the keys come with responsibility, don't they, and ownership. And uh, is there a picture up there of my car, my first car? <laughs> See, it's a Buick Skylark. There's my brother's. And uh, somebody hopped this Buick Skylark up. It was blue metallic. It had Kreger, it had uh, mag wheels on it, chrome wheels. It uh, had four on the floors, a 357 somebody threw in there. And uh, man, that, that was mine. Uh, but, it, but I had to take care of that car too if I was going to drive it. You know, keys come with authority. I remember back in the early 70s, uh, I was working at a dealership called Klaus Volkswagen. And uh, a new owner had come in. They had sold the, 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 pro, the, uh, the whole business to a, to a younger guy, a uh, Jewish fella. And uh, he took a liking to me. He needed somebody to take care of all the vending machines in his business. There was a soda machine, a coffee machine, and uh, the cups always got stuck in that. always had to work on that. And um, there was uh, the snack machines. And uh, he gave me the keys to his, his, his property. And uh, they're separate from the work of the dealership, and he would receive a certain amount of percentage off the money and the coins that were collected out of that, and he gave me that responsibility. I felt like a little bit of a bigwig walking around with the, with the keys, you know, and uh, these keys. And, uh, and so here's the, he owned those machines. He, he was the owner of those keys, but he gave me uh, the trust and responsibility to collect that money and write it down and give him uh, the proceeds. Think about the first key you've ever owned. Oh, wait a minute, I got to back up a little bit. Is there is my Pac Man up there? Uh, is there, if you go back in time, uh, the, we had these consoles. Remember Pong? That was the big breakthrough, Pong. And uh, we had a console there. Remember that little thing that went back and forth, boop, boop, boop. And, and that was big technology back then. And it cost you a quarter to play that game. And uh, and also he had a Pac Man, but Pac Man was first on the console. You had to sit down and play. Was that up there? Yo, Pat, there it is. And uh, remember that? They still have those, I think. And, uh, but he gave me that responsibility. Think about your first key. It could have been from your parents to, to your house because when you came over from school, maybe they were working. That's how you got in the house. Or maybe your first key was a lock you know, to your bicycle, lock your bicycle up. But mine was a mini Honda 60cc. You see, my brother and I, every, every boy wants a mini bike, don't you, when you're growing up? And I wanted a mini bike, but we got a mini motorcycle. Is that up there? Man, when I saw that thing, my heart started thumping. I'll never forget that thing. I love that thing. When I got that key, I, I slept with that key. My mother's out there smiling because there's a story. She actually wrecked my, my mini motorcycle the first day we had it. My father, my father made her ride it, and, uh, and she wrecked that thing. It was, it was, a, beautiful, it was a great day because I'm so excited. I got my mini bike. I'm driving around. Then my father puts my mother on it. She wrecks it. It's like... Upper and downer on the same day. <laughs> but anyway, that key came with ownership. I slept with that key. Nobody else could get that key but me. That was to my mini bike, and nobody could have it. Then I got another key, a key to lock it up. And so it showed ownership. So I was curious about, um, so I went to Uncle Google, and I was curious about how many keys to cities have been given out through the years. And so 100, I counted 182, I'm sure I probably missed some, of towns or cities that award people in the likes of like Harry Truman. Harry Truman got the keys to Spokane, Washington, because him and his family went camping there one time. That was in 1948. And then most recently in 2016, the rock group KISS was given by the mayor to Green Bay, the keys to Green Bay, Wisconsin. And I thought, I hope Brett Favre got the keys to Wisconsin too. But anyway, the honorary keys are rewards for a lifetime invitation to that city. That's what it basically represents. Because people ask, well, what's the key unlocked to the city? Basically, it's an invitation, but it's honorary. Our keys sometimes come with great responsibility. It depends on what type of uh, job you have. And sometimes there's even a greater authority, and especially as I think right now what's happening in our world in this nuclear atomic age, world leaders 
have that key uh, to bring devastation upon our world and even genocide of many people. And there's not so many stable uh, out there, unfortunately. But see, Peter's keys, the keys that he received from Jesus, prepares human souls for Holocaust and, to, and, and for the death that we'll all face someday. So the keys he received from Jesus that day were the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And I want to talk about that a little bit. It was an insurance for everyone uh, that has to face the, the end of life. And so we see here that Jesus was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, which is also synonymous with the church. If you look at verse 18 in your Bible, Jesus called the kingdom of heaven the church on earth, in which every baptized believer enters into. So it's like you, you enter the church, you enter the kingdom of God. And so, uh, boom, we have that big nuclear explosion, and, uh, and you get that flash burn, and you're gone. And uh, in that minute, if you're a Christian, you wake up in heaven. Now, that's going to be a little bit faster than the thief on the cross. But that's exactly what God is promising us. So, number one, I want to look at the purpose and the keys and the authority of these keys that Peter just received. And uh, number one, this is a paraphrase of verse 19. Whatever, he said, whatever you bind on earth that is in the church has already been bound in heaven. Because on the day of Pentecost, the apostles would receive the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the authority uh, from heaven, like a direct, direct connect of authority. So whatever they bound here was bound in heaven. And I'll give you one of the examples. In Matthew 18, we have a situation where Jesus is teaching them if your brother sins against you. He says, go to your brother personally. And if he sins and he doesn't listen... Uh, then you bring witnesses. Then if he doesn't listen, you come before the church. If he's not willing to repent, he says, cast him out as if he's a Gentile or a tax collector. And that day, it would be somebody outside of the Jewish uh, church and synagogue and temple worship at the time. So it's a binding and a loosening. So the apostles were given the authority to permit and forbade. Also, in, in, in all the Gospels, especially here in Mark chapter 6, verse 11, as Jesus sends out the apostles with this authority to preach the gospel, to prepare them for Pentecost, he says these words to them in Mark 6, 11. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. Here again, they have the authority to bind and to loose with the gospel. But the primary reason for the keys that were given to Peter that day was to preach the gospel, the good news. Now, the subject in this passage, if you look at verse 13, is the question that Jesus poses to all human beings. Who do they say is the Son of Man? And Peter got it right. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So for that reason, Peter is given the opportunity to preach the gospel, first there to the Gentiles at Pentecost, and I mean to the Jews, and then later on to the Pentecost to uh, the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So in Acts, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. They begin to preach. Peter stands with the 11, preaches the death, burial, res resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel here is unleashed. It tells us there that 3,000 souls were brought into the kingdom uh, that day. And so the doors are flung open as the gospel begins to be preached. But keep in mind, look, notice verse 18. Jesus says, I will build my church. So the apostles are given the authority through the gospel to preach, but it's Jesus' church. He adds to the number of souls that are being saved. It says this directly in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Let me read it. So the apostles would preach, teach, share, and, and Jesus would add. And the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. Another example of this is Revelation chapter 1. Let me read two verses here, 17b and 18. Jesus says this of himself as he introduces his authority to the church. He says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. And so Jesus alone has the keys and the authority over death in Hades, over judgment of humankind. They simply had the opportunity to preach the gospel, the confession who Jesus is, the savior of the world. And they used those keys, didn't they? And he built the kingdom in that early day. You know, it's a good thing that Jesus is building the church. Man gets in the way of that all the time, doesn't he? 
See, man gets his opinion in there. He gets his feelings in there about how the church should be and how the church should be, uh, 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 should be taught in the church. And then we have many denominational churches spread out throughout the world, throughout uh, history. But Jesus wanted to make it clear right here from the beginning that I will build my church. We're instruments of the gospel. We carry it out and we share it. He wanted to make that clear. And there isn't a better example than right here, the apostle Peter himself. So look in your Bibles and read verses 20 through 21, 21 through 23. And so here Peter makes his great confession. And he's like, yeah, look at me. I've got the keys. Look at me. I, I was first. I had the answer. I, I knew what to say. Matter of fact, he got so puffed up, they started talking among, among one another, saying, oh, who's going to be on Jesus' left? Who's going to be on the right? I guess Peter thought, man, he was the man. But notice what happens here. Look at verse 21. Jesus says to them, after Jesus, uh, Paul, uh, Peter's confession, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And, uh, and so it's amazing. Here Jesus is giving them this information. Peter, you have the keys. You're going to bind uh, on earth, will be bound in heaven. You're going to have this authority. Uh, he's probably excited about that, but he also doesn't really understand it, does he? And like any of us, our flesh gets away. Our personal ideas, our personal concepts of what Jesus should be and what the kingdom should be will get in, get in the way. And that's exactly what happened here. So the same ones, the same Peter who just got it right. Notice what it says in verse 22. Peter, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he in turn said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's interests. So we see very quickly here, probably 15 minutes later, here Peter's hindering. He's a stumbling block to Jesus. And that's why it's important that we, we get out of the way. It's so easy for us to argue over little church things. It's easy for us to say, well, we give in to you know, the current ebb and flow of the modern church today. And uh, churches are doing so many things now today. You say, Ben, are they reading the same Bible? You know, they're saving people by different means. They're doing uh, activities. And sure, you're bringing people into the church. But are you teaching them Scripture? And so it's so easy for a man to get off track. His own personal preferences get in the way. Jesus says, this is of man. You're setting your mind on man's things and not setting your mind on the things of God. Jesus made it very clear from the beginning as he gives this commission and gives out the keys. So in that very moment, notice what happens next. Jesus is a teaching moment. Peter's bold, pulls Jesus aside. He brings him back with the disciples and notice what he says. Verse 24, then Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For wh whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake uh, will find it. And so Peter had to deny his feelings at that moment. He had to let Jesus go. He spends three or four chapters there in John trying to explain to the apostles, look, I have to go. The kingdom will not begin unless I go. The helper must come. He will guide you as I have guided you, but he'll be with you all the time. And he will show you how to build my kingdom. That's that direct connect that they had. And so the power and authority of the keys rest in God's interest, not our own. That's hard to get out of the way sometimes, isn't it? We want the church to grow. We want, we want to see the church prosper. We want to see the name of Jesus propagated, but we're not allowed to do it our own way. He wants to do it according to his word. So they did. They did deny themselves. Peter denied himself, and uh, he got himself out of the way. He crucified his flesh. That's what it means to take up your cross every day. And uh, the early church turned the world upside down. Wouldn't that be nice if we could do that starting right here? That's God's intention for every age and every generation, that the word would get out to the community. Now, how many of you agree that we're living kind of shadow times, times of darkness? And I don't know how close it is to perilous times because I've never been in a war, have you? I've never seen bloodshed. I really don't want to see it, do you? I don't want to see Holocaust. I don't want to see 
uh, depression. I don't want to see people starving. I don't want to see people begging. My grandmother said she used to wait for the government truck to come through the neighborhood. She heard it. She knew the sound of it. Like she knew the sound of, of the of the uh, uh, grocery cart coming up the up the street. She knew that there was government cheese and milk on that to feed her babies. I don't want to live through those times. Do you? But they could happen. They could happen at any time. We're not in control. Evil man's in control of our governments. And so the remedy is still the keys to the kingdom. And this leads to the second point. The keys were passed down to all Christians. The keys were passed down to us. Look what Peter says in his first letter to the church. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to be re- beginning to read from, verse, from chapter uh, 1, starting with verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with uh, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm sorry, starting with verse 4. Notice what it says here. He's talking to us, the church. And coming to him as living stones, which have been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up in, as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. His precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this came the the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For, For a stumbling block, because they are disobedient to the word, And to this doom they also are appointed. But you, the church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so Peter is saying that the keys have been passed down, the authority to preach the gospel has been passed down to the church. We're the living stones, not the rolling stones, but the living stones. And God has an expectation that we would live that way, that we're alive and well in Christ. But see, we haven't been given the same authority. The apostles, they had miraculous gifts and signs. They could write scripture. Uh, they did signs and wonders. And, uh, and uh, just a shadow of Peter falling on people would heal them, miraculous things. But we are given the whole continent of their word. But the New Testament teaches how to build the church. So we obey the commandments. But that's all we need, don't we? It's just the truth. So here Peter passes it on. He wants us to proclaim the excellence of a God. And so what is excellent about God? Has he done anything excellent for you? Sure, the list, we should have volumes of blessings. Matter of fact, many times when you pray, many times you probably do this, you go back from the beginning and say, from the day of your baptism, look how many blessings I've received from God. You know, it's a good thing to take inventory like that. That's why we do anniversaries and birthdays. It reminds us of, the, of life and our travels. And especially for the Christian, God has done excellent things. He still is, isn't he? He's called us out of darkness into a light. You know, sometimes I wonder if we forget this sometimes. That we're so enamored by light. We have so much light. We have so many good things. that we don't lose very much, do we? And uh, like other people in, in, in the world. And, uh, you know, the first Christians lost everything. They lost many of their inheritances. They were passed down through the Jewish nation. They lost their church. They lost uh, the fellowship of even their own families. Their families turned them in. They've been rejected uh, by the populace of that day, rejected by the Roman government, rejected by their own people, their own family. They lost a lot. But they gained what Peter here calls the marvelous light. That's what he's brought us into Uh, this marvelous light. And he's saying to us, proclaim that. Proclaim that light. You know, this present darkness that we're living in is a good opening to use your keys to the gospel. And I'll give you an example. My brother comes over. He's helping me remodel my mom's house. And uh, and so I'm always concerned. I'm always praying for an opening to talk to my brothers that are lost. I want them to know. And so this present darkness in the political atmosphere is a perfect opportunity to turn those keys. 
And so we're talking about the, 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 uh, the evil in our world today, and he recognized enough, even though we have opposing worldviews because I'm a Christian, he recognizes we're in trouble. And there's a lot of people out there that recognize our country is in trouble, that we've lost our moral compass, that danger is surrounding our world, that anything could happen anytime to change our comfort zone, the way we live now. And so it's actually, actually an opportunity to say, hey, but you can live in the light even though darkness is around. And it could get darker, but it's an opportunity. Has God done good things for us? How about the spring? Doesn't the spring just remind you of God's goodness? Remind you of the resurrection of life? We have this um, dogwood tree. We planted two dogwood trees, a white one and a pink one, and the, and the pink one, the white one never made it. And uh, dogwoods are hard to, to get going. Uh, they're very finicky. And uh, so we have this pink one, and the pink one is planted next to my driveway where the septic system, the gray water, travels around my yard from my tank in right there in that front yard. It's a big, giant hole they dug, and all that gray water goes in there. And some of you people who have city water don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, it's a very fertile area. And I said to Judy, look at the thousands of beautiful pink flowers on the dogwood this year. And first thought came to my mind is those roots have tapped into that gray water, and they're very nourished. Anyway, <laughs> maybe the sun would have, should have came out today. You guys would have woke up. Anyway, the grass is green again. You know, uh, we have zoysia grass. You know what zoysia grass is? Zoysia grass is the only grass you can get to grow in Anne Arundel County uh, effectively unless you have some clay mixed in. And, uh, and so it turns gold really quickly if it doesn't have any water. But it survives in sand and very little water. So it's, it's a really good uh, grass. So I love it when it turns back green. I like that. But I give God the glory for that. He did that. He designed that. He made it that way. Matter of fact, we live in a time today where we should be talking about God's creation more because so many people and so many kids have been brainwashed to believe in evolution, that it all happened by accident. Everything we see is designed. We have a reason to praise God. We have a reason to worship Him. We have a reason to thank Him every day just by the power of creation alone. But it seems as though we've become silent and they have the airwaves. They push it everywhere. It's on TV. You look at any of the um, uh, history channels or uh, what's Nova, any of them, all of them. Nobody gives credit to God. Everything is an accident. But yet they talk about the intrinsic design within everything. They just don't use those, they don't use those words. And so Peter's saying here, look, proclaim it. Tell it. You believe it, don't you? Don't hide it. Jesus said, don't hide it under a bushel. Light it up wherever you are. If we don't, it's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, this is a time in our history now, and I didn't think I would see it in my time. But Christianity is being persecuted, isn't it? It's politically incorrect. People don't want to be moral. People want to do it their own way. People want to find their own way. They want to have their own opinion. And so that light is blinding to them. And so look, one of the keys of sharing the gospel is your own heart when you sit down in the morning before you start the business of your day and you figure out the reasons why you need to praise God and give thanks. It's all over Scripture. Just go to the Psalms over and over and over again, praising God, thanking God. That's supposed to overflow out of your heart and into your conversation around people. And that's, that opens the door for the gospel. And so he gave us the keys of proclamation, and he wants us to use the keys. So this morning, I want you to take out your keys. Take out your, your keys. I want to hear some keys rattling. Take them out. Sometimes they're hooked to your belt, down in your pocket, in your purse. I carry these around because they're... they're the keys here to the church, and, uh, and uh, t- grab your house key. Got your house key? Grab, grab your house key. So you get your car keys. When you find your house key, go like this. I know you got them. So everybody's got them. Boy, listen to that sound. I, I love the sound of keys. Keys are cool. I've always liked keys. And uh, so, so take your house key. Now look, you wouldn't have that key. Unless God gave you the ability to earn, to get your apartment or your house or whatever you have. 
What do you do when you don't have your key to the house? Well, we have a key in a rock, a plastic rock, in a rock garden. And uh, never, you never leave a window open, do you? No, we don't do that nowadays. See, my grandma didn't even have a house key to her house. The door was always open. We didn't worry about crazies then. We cra- People are crazy now. Anybody will come to your house. Uh, one night, there's a big party at the far corner. We live on a corner, and there's a far corner of my neighborhood, and big party going on up there. They came to my house 3 o'clock in the morning. We had our bedroom window open. They're like, hey, 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 this is the place where the party is. No, you came to the wrong house. It's at the other corner. Had to shout, w- wake you up in the middle of the night. You see, that key to your house, how often do you use it? Probably every day, right? And uh, you won't tell anybody if you have a secret door that's not locked, like your back door. But we use it every day. You need it every day. We use keys every day, don't we? God needs us to use his keys. He said we're a royal priesthood. He made us royalty. You feel royalty today? Sometimes I think we forget that we're royalty to God. Then he said, we're a priesthood. We're his personal priesthood. Then he says, we're his own possession. He has a relationship with each one of us. And he has an expectation. He has a right to it. To proclaim who he is. It's easy in here to do it, but we have to do it out there when we meet people. He expects us to. This church won't fill up through programs. They're nice. They're fun. We'll have, we're bringing VBS back, and I'm glad we are. It's going to be a great time because you get to those little kids, and you keep planting the gospel. See, they don't resist it like adults do. And so we have a lot of fun doing VBS. But I'll tell you, what you take out of here, if you take your key with you, And if you decide today to use it, that's how the church will prosper. The leadership here at Seven Christian Church, we're not going to build a mega church on this property. But we're going to build other churches for Jesus. The the best way that happens is each one of us are serious about these keys that we take in. Now, earlier I read what Jesus told Peter and the apostles after Peter slipped up. And try to do it his way. So you've got to deny yourself. So the first step of being effective with these keys is you have to deny yourself. Because look, self every day is too busy. We're too busy with so many things. We have a whole itinerary before we even wake up. We're thinking about it before we go to sleep. When we wake up, then we rush around and do it. And we forget that we're holding keys that God personally gave us the day we were baptized. He says, I expect you to share this marvelous light that now I've put in you. And then notice what he says in in verses 26 and 27. He's trying to give us the apostles incentive to be successful, and he wants to do the same for us. Turn back to Matthew 16, and notice what he says here. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So he's saying, okay, if you want, don't want to deny yourself, here's what, here's what you get to look forward to. Go ahead. You can inherit the whole world. You can be Bill Gates the third. He could write in his will that you get all his money And wow, you're on your way, aren't you? You wouldn't have to deny your flesh anything. But he says, but you'll forfeit the kingdom of God. You'll forfeit the very moment that you open your eyes in death, eternal life, in the kingdom of riches that never ends, God's kingdom. Okay. But look, he goes on to say this. And this really flies home because it's it's not just about the allurement of riches. He goes on to say, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What did Esau give up for his inheritance? A bowl of oodles and noodles. He gave up the inheritance of the firstborn for a bowl of oodles and noodles. 
That's the closest soup that comes to cardboard and water. That's what he gave up. Some people exchange an affair. Some people exchange alcohol. How many things are you willing to exchange for a moment of pleasure for the kingdom of heaven, for your soul? Jesus then gives him incentive, verse 27 and 28, for the Son of Man is going to come in his glory and his Father with the angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. And those deeds happen to be your choice to do whatever you want to do. Whatever you decide to exchange for your soul, that's your deeds. You'll be judged on that. And then he says, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so he's telling the apostles in that very moment, on the day of Pentecost, it's going to happen. My kingdom will come. You'll be there. Peter, you'll preach the first sermon along with the eleven. And then the, the, the kingdom of heaven is open to all humanity until Jesus returns. So he's going to return to judge, but he also had already set up his kingdom, which we're a part of the day that you're baptized into Christ. But listen to what the apostle Paul said. Remember when Jesus said he would be with us always to the end of the age? Turn to Colossians chapter 4. Uh, that prophecy came true when he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell all believers. And so when we go out and, and we wake up in the morning and we uh, say this prayer, we remind ourselves when uh, uh, we get our keys to maybe open the first thing in the morning, maybe it happened to be our car, uh, that we'll remember that God gave us a responsibility to tell somebody, to proclaim his excellence, to, to uh, share the gospel. And what I love about what Jesus said in the Great Commission, he says, Lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. See, he promised the apostles they wouldn't be alone in this building his church. He's promised us the same thing. You're not alone when you finally take the courage to step out. When you decide tomorrow, I'm going to use the keys that God gave me because he deserves it. Because he saved me. When you decide to do that, he's there to help. I like that, don't you? I hope you do because, see, we're afraid of rejection. Don't worry about that. They're rejecting him. He's the one that moves the heart of the person when you speak the truth to them. He's doing that. Notice, notice what the Apostle Paul said here in Colossians 4, 3. We can pray. Paul said, verse 3, pray at the same time for us as well that God will open the door for the word so that we may speak forth the mysteries of Christ for which also I've been in change chains. And then he also gives us the attitude that we need to have. We need to be gracious towards outsiders. We need to be salt at season that people say, you know, I want some of that. That's living in the light. And so Paul says, look, you're not alone. Pray. God opens the door. See, we don't always use the key in the right place at the right time. Yeah, we may have the enthusiasm. We, we want to share in that moment. But it may not be the door that God has opened. So we have to surrender and let him open the door. He loves enthusiasm. Keep that. But ask him first. Um, just recently, when you're, when you're a minister of the gospel and um, you're uh, uh, sharing the ministry with people, uh, my schedule is in the evening, and most of you folks know this, because in the evening people are home. You can have a lot more appointments that way. Any time my appointments finish up, finish counseling with someone or leading somebody to the Lord, I always pray, Lord, refill my plate. Keep my plate full. You think he answers that prayer? Every time. He always refills your plate if you're willing to use the keys and share the gospel. It's not a big secret. You just have to be willing to do it. Do you think God can use you? You say, oh, no, I, I can't stand up here and do it. You know, I, don't, I have a hard time with this, too. You don't see it. My legs shake a lot. Uh, and the church knows this. My real gift is service. But service brings people to Jesus. Your grandparents, 
were brought to Jesus through service, shoveling some snow. Shoveling snow means relationship. It starts a relationship, just shoveling snow for your neighbor. And when you start that relationship, there's an opportunity to share the gospel. Now, I want you to, to choose a key, uh, any key that you have there. Um, uh, these keys right here I received from the, uh, from the elders of the church. You know, they didn't say, here, you know, hand me a key. And, uh, but what happens is when you're willing to serve, your key ring fills up. That's all it is. It's not like, hey, give me the keys. I'm going to feel powerful. You ever see me wearing these like this and saying, I got the keys. I'm the key man. No. These keys came through just willing to be servant. That's what they come from. And so I chose this key right here. This key right here. This key right here is the oddest key on my ring. And it's a uh, key that opens. It's a um, Allen wrench key. And it opens those back doors to the gym. You stick it in there and clasp it and it keeps the door open or it closes it. Uh, loose and bind. Whatever you bind on earth in the church is bound in heaven. And God wants the gospel to be preached. Now, I want you to take one of the keys. I'm, I chose this one. And every time, because I have these keys every day, you have your keys every day. Every time I see this key, I'm going to remind myself of Peter confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And there isn't a better key. There isn't a key on this key ring worth more than this one to give somebody. Matter of fact, I can say, here, take my keys, and now you do all the service representing those, those keys right there. I quit. I'm done. But I want that one back. I want that one. That's the one that opens the key to heaven. This is decision time. Every one of us, every day, every morning, has to decide the commandment Jesus gave to Peter that we're going to use our key to help people into the kingdom. Somebody helped you. Somebody helped you. And I know there's folks sitting here this morning that I've talked to and maybe you've talked to as well. They need to make a decision. And that decision is to accept the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and allow His salvation to come into your life in the baptistry here. So it's decision time, and I hope we all make a decision to use our key. There's some of these to make a decision. As we take the offering this morning, come on up. Father, we pray. You have given us a marvelous kingdom. You call it a marvelous light. And so, Father, in that light, the gospel. You told us to proclaim it. And part of proclaiming is giving. And what we give is an investment in eternal life. It's just not for this building which will someday go away. It won't be here. It's in an eternal kingdom. So Father, as we give, let us realize we're giving to something bigger than what we see. The kingdom of God. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.